Mzanzi, this time around, I'm in the Northwest province in Brits. I'm going to be talking to Hopolang Tladinyane and his three kids. He's got three boys, two of them are teenagers, and they are part of his operation here. I want to ask him, what is his succession plan? He's so proud of his kids, you'll get to see that. And also, we'll talk about the livestock that they are farming, along with lucerne and sunflower as well. So, it's going to be a great show. Stay with us. How's it, how's it, how's it, Hopalang and family? Tony. How's it, guys? Are you well? Yeah. All right. Good, good. I want to borrow your father for a little bit. You guys go and do your morning work. Are you well? Yeah, no, we're good. Very good. Listen, every morning I start off, I have to have a bit of coffee. Can okay. I invite you to for, for coffee with me? Yeah, let's, let's do coffee. Nice one. Hopalang, thank you so much for letting us spend a bit of time on your farm. But let's talk about you on a personal level. Yes. You're coming from a, a family, you know, on both sides, You're from your mother's side and your father's side. It's a farming family, isn't it? Give me a bit yes. of background. Yes, not true, uh, Tony. Uh, from my mother's side, really, my grandfather was a farmer since 1950s. He was farming in the Mafiking area in Northwest, and you remember the laws of the land ownership in South Africa by then. Fortunately, that was when Botswana was getting independence. So around 1960s, uh, he moved to Botswana. From when we grew up, obviously, it's my grandfather. We used to visit him a lot, so we used to go to the farm. On the other side as well, my father was, uh, he was a pastor in the Lutheran church, but wherever he was, Besides being a pastor, he was always farming. And as well, from primary school, I was always involved with farming, especially goats. I was a goat head. <laughs> then uh, after school, I remember I used to take the dogs and go head out the goats, uh, take them back. So I don't remember any time of my life in my childhood when I was not involved in, in farming. But now tell me, I mean, you're uh, for, on a professional point, you're a mechanical engineer. Where's the mechanical engineer on the farm? Yeah, look, that's where, I think from primary school as well, I used to like cars. I remember I had a friend, we used to build cars with wires and all yeah. that. So I was always crazy about cars. Fortunately, I studied mechanical engineering at the University of Cape Town. I did mechanical engineering and naturally, as I said, I used to love cars. I went into the motor industry. My first job was in Utenik at the Volkswagen plant in Utenik. But the love for farming never really went away. I mean, a lot of guys, my friends, were used to be surprised at the varsity. In my spare time, I used to read Farmers Weekly, farming magazines and all that. <laughs> and while I was in PE, I couldn't farm. There was There's not a lot of farms that I knew around in that area. So I decided I must come home. And I got a job, fortunately, at the BMW in Roslyn at the factory so that I could be closer to my father's cattle and uh, our area here. So I moved to Gauteng. Uh, now, you are also here since 2004. You settled here with your wife, your three sons. They were also born here. Yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, you know, it, was it difficult to convince your wife to say, listen, let's go now. You are coming with me. Yeah, We're going to be yeah. on the farm. No, I think she'll speak for herself, but <laughs> yeah. I, I meet a lot of guys who are farming and they don't stay on the farms. When I ask them, they say, no, the wife doesn't like the farm. But I think we are still young that time. It was fairly easy sell for her, for, for, for us. We, I didn't struggle with that. Uh, we just convinced each other that we will look for a farm. Because buying a farm is not like buying a car or a house, it's a fairly complex process. So we had to go through that, uh, that process. She was always there with me until we eventually got this farm. And from day one, we decided we were going to stay on this farm. Uh, that transition was not easy. Uh, I was actually wondering how am I going to cope here uh, uh, at the farms, far from the shops. But I think with time, it came very uh, easy for me to cope and I'm really enjoying being far from the suburbs. Raising three young farmers has never been easy. They have to make sure that they perform well at school. I make sure that they do their homework and once that is done, then that's when they can go and do their farming uh, activities.
Now tell me about your boys. You've got three boys and they were all born on the farm, per se. Yeah, uh, we moved here around September 2004 and our firstborn was born in December 2004. So all my boys were, were born on the farm. I think when he was about five, six, I went with him to Nampo, carried him on my back the whole day. Yeah. But it was the most exciting day. To a point, I think when he was at primary school, he used to have a nickname. They used to call him Nampo because he used to write letters every year <laughs> to the teacher to say he's going to Nampo. And naturally, the second one as well got the influence from the brother. He's crazy about farming, uh, but he's more uh, as he grew up, he started developing a love for cars and more mechanical things. He's more of a workshop guy. He, they do welding, they do yeah. the manufacturing yeah. of things. And he's crazy about cars. Uh, so he's more of a mechanical guy. So he helps us here on the farm mostly with the mechanical stuff, uh, repairing of yeah. equipment and all that. And the youngest one still likes cattle. He likes livestock, but he's also like, uh, I think mostly because of the influence of the brother he likes uh, crop farming as well so all of them are really involved in farming they really know their stuff when it comes to farming a lot of people when they come and visit here they get surprised by the level of knowledge they have for the farm how important is it that uh, you know you, uh, farming is a long-term thing it's yeah. a patient it's a patient yeah. game yeah. and how important is uh, the fact that you almost have a, a, your succession plan that you you can be rest comfortably to say listen my sons are interested in what yeah, i'm doing yeah. i may be able to yeah, leave this to yeah. them yeah look it's fairly comforting because it's it's fairly critical i think uh, farming is a really multi-generational thing for me my biggest task is to acquire this farm uh, really to hand it over to them uh, step every generation builds on the the, the next generation remember i mean the other thing is from when they are still young, they still they already know the, uh, the industry. It's a fairly closed industry. I mean, a lot of people don't notice. There's only about 40,000, 50,000 commercial farmers in South Africa. So it's a closed world uh, where you have to make your name, develop your uh, yourself within those circles and all that. And they are fortunate enough they started that from young. Fantastic. Hopalong, are you ready to take me to your farm? I want yeah, to see this no, operation. Okay. You can do that. 100%. Thanks. So Mzanzi, it's that time again where I get to speak to the farmer about his operation. I'll speak to the father, Hopolang, and also find out from the two kids what part they're playing. Because as we know, they're still a little too young to take over, but they are helping their father out. So Hopolang, take me through what you're doing here on your farm. We do start uh, cattle farming, uh, mainly with uh, cementella breed and some few simbras. And uh, then we do crop as well. Uh, uh, depending on the season, we decide whether we plant soyas or we plant maize. And uh, naturally, because we've got the livestock, we do fodder, which will be mainly uh, sugar grease or maize that we mainly do silage with. Uh, so the silage is mainly for feeding cattle. We do lucerne as well. But lucerne, most of it we sell, I would say 80% of it we sell. The rest, 20% we use on our livestock. And lastly, we have small stock, which is uh, goats. I've been farming with goats since a long time ago. And uh, lately we introduced sheep which I share with my boys. So what determined stud breeding for you? Yeah, we've got a small farm, it's 100 hectares only. So naturally, normally you need 10 hectares per cow. We've got 50 here, so we couldn't increase beyond that. But now with that farming, at least each and every animal's value is a bit higher. So we trying to get a higher value animals. Okay, uh, you, you made a few changes because I, I know you want to basically grow this enterprise. Yeah. What have you done? Yeah, lately we, we rented out 
two of our pivots, 20 hectares, uh, to my neighbor is planting vegetables yeah. so that we could focus. We recently acquired about uh, 200 hectares of land in my home village, Jericho. Mm. It's about 30 kilometers from here. So this season it was quite hectic because we had to debush the 200 hectares and plant uh, in such a short period. So I realized I was not going to make it on the farm and the traveling in between and all that. So we focused in Jericho, we planted sunflowers. This year we managed to plant about 60 hectares. I've got my 30 hectares and the boys have got uh, the 30 hectares. So we've got sunflowers in Jericho, but we managed to debush the whole 200 hectares. So hopefully next season, uh, we'll plant the whole 200 hectares with sunflowers. And later we will introduce for crop rotation, we'll introduce soyas there and maybe sugar grace make some feed as well there. Okay, fantastic. I think it's time for me to speak to the boys, as you call them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, good. So, Mutlapeli, 17 years old, you're the oldest son here, right? You've been living on this farm uh, from the day you were born. Tell me, what, what do you do on the farm? I practically do all the work that has to do with the fields. All the field preparation, planting, everything, I do it. Ria, at 14 years old, your older brother is, I'm sure, is always behind you, pushing you, but you're not in the fields. What, what, what's your speciality? I mostly work in the workshop to fix the tractors and whatever breaks down, I fix it most of the time. Okay. Uh, Mutla, as the oldest son, do, uh, you know, what, what are you learning from your father on the farm? Practically, I learned everything I knew. I learned how the market works, which seeds work a better way, because here yeah, we're working on two locations, Jericho and this side, so we need to use different cultivars and all those population changes because dry land and irrigation. So, yeah, that's what, those are the type of things I'm learning. Also, the preparation for dry land and uh, irrigation, it's yeah. a bit different, so those are the things I'm learning. Okay, and I know you also run some of the machinery on, in the field as well. All of the machinery. All of the machinery. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he says so with such pride, that, that's really fantastic to see. Okay, so Ria, your father is a qualified uh, motor mechanical engineer. Is that why you're leaning towards the engineering side? Yes, definitely. I think I, I got the mechanical side from him. Most of the time I service the cars as well. Um, last uh, clutch plate for one of our tractors was broken. We had to fix it. So yeah, I helped as well. You, you, you're loving it on the farm? Yeah. Is this something that you want to do for the rest of your life? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so young man, tell me about what you've planted this season and why. We've uh, planted sunflower in Jericho because uh, sunflower, the market is looking good. It's a, and it's also a crop that works pretty well under dry land conditions. Uh, are there any challenges when it comes to farming in, in, in this particular area? Dry land, you have to get the proper populations right because if you don't get that right, your plants might not even make it. Your fields have to be clean because any weeds in the field will take all the water away from the plants. And then, yeah, those are the only challenges we have that side. I normally just help my father to do the sheep and goats. I plant and also when they take out bales on the farm, I help them to drive. I enjoy driving the tractor. Favorite animal is a sheep because they are easy to handle and I love them. Um, when I grow up, I want to be a farmer. Right, guys, here's the question that I have to ask every single farmer that I visit. If I could grant you one single wish, what would it be, Ria? A bigger workshop with more machining tools to work with. What's up, Buy me a farm in Bumalang. Why in Bumalang? Interesting area, good rainfall. Yeah. Okay, if I'm in Pumalanga, father, what do you want? Yeah, I uh, can't wait for them to take over the grain operations so that I can focus on the livestock, the cattle especially. Give me a 3,000 hectare farm with 300 head of breeding females, I'll be happy. In farming, generational wealth means passing on more than just land, money or assets. It's about inscribing a deep understanding of nature's rhythms in the next generation, an instinct for the land, 
and knowledge that cannot be learned from books alone. It's wonderful to see Khopalang passing these values on to the farmers of tomorrow. Welcome back to African Farming, Zanzi. Now, Khopolang Tladnyane's sons are still young, and their succession journey still has a fairly long course to run. But there's no harm in starting early. Now, in fact, many farmers leave this critical process far too late. Today, our expert panel is going to give us all some advice on the various elements of succession planning that will help ensure stability, sustainability, and longevity in a farming operation. Guys and lady, thank you so much for joining me. Ratsilani from Afrivet. Thank you well. so much, Toli. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Uh, from Flay Central, Lisa Marie, how are you? I'm good in yourself. I'm fine, thank you. Uh, and also, Praveen, how are you? Good, thank you. Great to be here. Fantastic. Thanks, good to see you as always. And Nico from uh, Standard Bank, our banker. Are you also? Very well, thanks. Fantastic. All right, Lisa Marie, may I start with you, please? Uh, how important is it for the next generation to keep that reputational value when it comes to livestock? You know, Tony, you can never start too early, especially when you want to give over the reins at some stage to your, your children or to a partner. The, I believe that moving through all the motions right from the get-go, either by genetics, selection, um, relations, where you market, where you buy your feed, who do you trust, where do you go for advice, you can never start too early, especially when you have children that needs to take over in the long run. Mm -hmm. A little bit of advice for those kids maybe? Look what daddy is doing. <laughs> Watch dad <laughs> Watch every dad. single day, every morning. Yeah. Okay, Ratslan, uh, you know, when it comes to the health of the animals as well, that's very important for those kids to start learning from the father, isn't it? True. That, that's correct, Tony. The, the issue of succession planning is very important. Um, the story of Hopalang portrays the picture of what, what must happen going forward for all the farmers throughout the continent. Um, they need to know how, when to vaccinate and for what. They need to know which um, health uh, or a veterinarian or an animal health technician that they are working around. They also need to be taught. Uh, they need to attend the trainings as well. It has to be a, a very component that um, any person who's taking over needs to be trained. Um, they also need to be taught how the market works, uh, trends and so forth, because uh, it's, it's useless uh, producing so well and then you are unable to, to reach the market. They also need to be taught um, basic important things, how to manage finances, how to take care of, or how to manage uh, staff around the farm. Um, the, the issue of succession is, is very important. We cannot uh, look uh, elsewhere. Nico, talking about the, uh, you know, managing finances and everything, it's, it's easier said than done, isn't it? And uh, is it always easier to bring in, a, uh, let's say, an accountant or keep it in-house uh, from a family perspective? Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, all the technical skills, you find that normally uh, the handover process or, uh, on, on that side of, of the business normally has a natural progression and, and, and that's where the kids start to, to pick up what's happening uh, and what they need to do. But the more you move closer to the heart of the business there where the, where the money ticks over, it's, it's always something that it seems like the, the older generation thinks that that, car, that level of decision making still remains with them whilst the children is out there uh, executing the practical stuff and there's nothing per se wrong with it but you have to at some stage get uh, the new generation into the financial decision making and more importantly the st strategic uh, direction of the of the business and that's where the difficult part sits and i don't think it's necessarily limited just to agriculture i think it is a it's a it's a it's a human trait which which makes it sometimes difficult to hand over those critical decisions that will determine the long-term life or death of your business to the younger generation and and that's where you you need uh sometimes outside guidance to make sure that 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 is 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 guided in the right direction so, Praveen, what I'm hearing from uh, Nico is that, listen, learn to let go, let those reins go. But also, you need to be practical about this, isn't it? 
Absolutely. Um, don't take for granted that, you know, um, when you're ready to let go, somebody's going to be ready to take over. So, you know, training, making sure that that hands-on experience there, that technical knowledge, um, sometime formal training may be required. Make sure all of that's in place. But also, never forget that there's a process that needs to take place when that handover happens. And remember that it can happen due to unforeseen circumstances, death, disability, for example. So make sure the, the legal and the paperwork's also taken care of. So, you know, uh, if you're going to be handing it down to uh, either somebody in the family or putting it into a trust, make sure that there's somebody responsible for that and that when that event takes place, somebody's ready to make that happen. Because remember that you've got your funders, you've got other stakeholders and investors in your business that whose interests also need to be protected. And that needs to be done in the proper way. We, we take that too much for granted that because it's a family operation, things will happen smoothly. It doesn't most of the time. Uh, and that's what we need to be very careful. Get your paperwork in order. Absolutely. Razilani, just a quick one from you, please, because uh, just picking up on what's been said already, that the training, there's training on, on the field, you're learning from what you're seeing, but also when it comes to animal health, you need formal training. Exactly. 100%. That's correct. Um, Tony, uh, a succession planning can never exist without uh, a training. You need to involve them while they, they are still young send them to formal trainings, uh, send them to um, courses, uh, capacitate them, because these are the ex exactly the same people who are going to take over um, in the long run. Actually, the, the succession planning, it's a journey. You need to work on them, capacitate them. When they are ready, you are still around, you are walking this journey with them up until they take over. Right, please give us one last bit of advice when it comes to succession planning. Nico? Make sure that your vision is shared and make sure that your structure, your organizational structure is of such a nature that a handover can take uh, place smooth. Pravin? Put it down on paper. Don't take for granted that somebody is going to execute on what's supposed to be happened. Make sure it's recorded. From a market's point of view, Lisa Marie? I believe in relationships. Build good, good relationships right from the start. And then you've got an easier handover and advice for the next generation. Okay, that's learning from yourself. Involve them while they are still young, capacitate them, invest on them, send them for formal trainings, and then allow them to come and, and offer whatever they have learned from those institutions. Fantastic advice, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on African Farming. Great being Thank here. You. Thanks, Thank Rani. You. So there you have it. Whether you're training the youth, handing over the reins, or stepping into big shoes, this transfer process plays a vital role in the future of food security of Mzanzi. We wish you all the success in the world. So catch us again next week, same time, same place. So find us on our social media pages using hashtag African Farming and on our website, africanfarming.com. And remember, we farm better together. Mm -hmm.